basically, this is going to be a talk about the conceptual physics of the pole vault. And my name's Will Reefer, and I coach here with Pole Vault STL as one of the coaches. With that in mind, first thing I would like to thank Clinton Tanner uh, and the Fieldhouse and Edge Athletics, especially because this is the host facility and our host. Um, Chris Soler, who's uh, the head coach for Pole Vault STL. Uh, Kurt Bligensdorfer, uh, Russ Broderick, Gary Marshall, uh, a special thanks to uh, one of my head coaches, Mike Genge, who gave me an opportunity to coach the pole vault and gave me excellent athletes as well. And also my wife, Tina, for putting up with this obsession. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> why, why should I be standing up here giving this lecture? Well, <clears throat> I was uh, a pole vaulter in high school. I actually believe that I learned how to pole vault from Rick Attig, who's coached uh, both at Nebraska and Kansas, and has also been the men's Olympic vault coach. Um, I vaulted at Ohio State University. And the other part to go with that is that I studied engineering physics while I was at uh, Ohio State University, and then um, math and science education with Missouri Baptist University. So I have a little bit different background than a lot of mo <clears throat> and then a lot of other pole vault coaches who haven't studied advanced math and physics. Um, I was captain of my high school math team. I won uh, awards for mathematics and science, and so I. I have a little bit different view of the event than people who haven't studied physics do. And the way this works out is uh, for all the technique things we want to do, there is some underlying reason and logic having to do with physics that informs us about those activities that we want to do in technique. And I believe if I uh, go through the physics of the event that it will help uh, coaches understand the event a little bit better, understand the importance of certain aspects of technique, and that it will make the event hopefully safer and help uh, people jump higher. So that's the purpose of this lecture. <clears throat> and. Uh, it's a very difficult lecture because I've had these conversations with many, many coaches and they inevitably do not go very well. That's because there's uh, some different aspects of um, the social situation of coaching the event and the dialogues that we have about it. So first of all, I think there's two ways that we could go about coaching the event. One of those ways is actually pretty simple, and it uh, has to do with uh, trial and error, experimental science, and then what I call pictographic coaching, which is to say, if you pick a very successful pole vaulter in history, and this would be within the last uh, you know, three to four decades or so, <clears throat> at the point that we start using flexible pole vault poles, and you get your vaulter to look exactly like this highly successful vaulter, so someone who's like won the Olympics or been a world champion or set a world record, man or woman, um, your vaulter's gonna do pretty well on maximizing their potential. It, and it's really, it's kind of that simple. If you watch the video of, of this uh, championship vaulter and your vaulter can mimic those motions, they're gonna do, do pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not terribly hard. And in fact, I believe this is the way that most uh, coaches work in sports in a lot of, and also particularly the pole vault. So we watch other pole vaulters. So each time a vaulter comes down the runway and vaults, it's a little bit like an experiment. And in fact, with my vaulters, there are periods where I might not coach them very little other than get them to experiment with, you know, getting on the pole and riding the pole and, and seeing what happens when they do different things, okay? 
The other thing that we do is we hold tournaments all the time. Like I said, this could be the Olympics or a high school track meet or world championships, but those sort of have a pyramid shaped, you know, maybe junior high track meet and then we have high school conference or a state track and field meet and then we have nationals and then we have world championships and Olympics. And that invariably the people that pass through those levels of these tournaments are going to be technically successful in the pole vault. <clears throat> uh, there's a little bit of a relationship between uh, the dynamics of what a human person can generate in terms of power and energy that the top athletes also have to pair that ability to generate speed and power won't be successful. So at some point, uh, you know, if you're not technically sufficient in the pole vault, you would get sort of weeded out from the highest levels of competition. And the reverse logic is, again, that the people that have been highly successful in the event are technically proficient and efficient. That's one way to go about it. The other way to go about it would be what I call rationally, which would be to use uh, what we know about physics, uh, math and science, and inform us about what's happening in the event to hopefully get better at it. That's part of what, a big part of what this lecture is about. So, a lot of it has to do about how we talk about the event. Now, it, it, and this causes a little bit of a problem in, I've got you know 12 pages of notes here, and how to go about this in a sort of linear process um, so that it, it, you know, it's sort of you know, logical and laid out, and that you can follow it. The problem is, uh, there's so many elements to sort of convey and speak about that that's a little bit hard to do. And I went over and over and over how I want to start this lecture <laughs> and make it um, understandable and uh, yet have impact. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this jump. And I know it's a little bit hard for you to see. I wish I would have done a little better with my graphics. But this is Mondo Duplantis. Uh, he's generally considered to be the greatest schoolboy uh, pole vaulter in all of history. He holds, I believe, a dozen or more world age group records as a pole vaulter. This is his championship jump from the European Championships. This crossbar is at 6.05 meters which is, uh, I believe, roughly about 19 feet, 8 inches in the air. There's only been one person, and that's Sergei Buka. He's the man on the right, who has jumped higher than 6.05 meters outdoors. Uh, there have been several other men who have jumped this height outdoors. But what we want to notice here is he's not just barely going over this. He's going way over this, okay? And uh, there's only been two people that I've ever seen with this kind of jump, and that was Sergei Buka, again, the man on the right, and the current overall men's world record holder, Renaud Lavillani. This doesn't happen all the time. <clears throat> so these middle four pictures are still shots of this jump, and if it weren't for these this jump and these still frames, I might not be giving this lecture because this jump is very extraordinary for a lot of reasons, even besides the fact that he's jumping this high. So I captured this still frame of his takeoff. And uh, no coach, and I've showed the other coaches over here that I named today, so I showed this like Russ Broderick who coaches at Lindenwood University. And <laughs> I'm like, no coach would ever coach their athlete to take off like this. 
And Russ was like, exactly. Uh, this is a very unique takeoff. Uh, normally we like to see the, his takeoff foot, so that's his left foot. We want to see it right under this top hand, okay? We wanna see his arms straight, they're bent. Coaches, there are certain coaches that will tell you, you cannot put pressure on the pole with this left arm. It is very obvious right here that he's putting pressure on this pole and it's bending. Uh, and part of the thing that comes about with this that I'm talking about when uh, there are coaches who would say that this jump, because of the position he's in, he's going to be losing energy. I find it remarkable that he can get this high in the air and be losing energy here, which he's not. <laughs> and that's part of the reason I'm going through this. Okay? So then we have four more frames. And basically the one thing I would like to point out here is this. Some coaches say that you are going to swing on your top hand. That's his right hand. And if we look, he takes off here. And as this moves forward, his top hand is actually moving this way which means he's counter swinging on his top right hand. No one in the world I know of coaches the pole vault that you're going to counter swing. Now he's swinging his legs underneath at the hip, but this is a very unorthodox sort of jump. And I'm gonna go through physics of why this is possible especially when you have some coaches out there that say this type of jump is physically impossible. <laughs> <clears throat> so this has a lot to do with a philosophy of science. Okay, so, and to point out the difference between uh, technique and a dialogue that appears scientific, I'm gonna point something out. So once again, I mentioned this is already, this is Sergei Buka. He's currently still the world outdoor record holder at 6.15 meters. He broke the world record uh, some over 30 times, generally considered to be the greatest pole vaulter in the world. See these socks? Those are pretty interesting looking socks. I remember those from when I was in high school, he was wearing those socks. I'm gonna say the reason he jumped 6.15 uh, <clears throat> meters over six meters so many times is those are magic socks. Okay? And you say, well, that's not scientific. And I say, he's wearing the socks though, correct? And you're like, yeah. And I'm like, he's the greatest pole vaulter in the world. And you're like, yes. And I'm like, well, it's magic socks. It's these magic socks. And you're like, but, 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 and I'm like, does he have the socks on? And you say, yes. So there's, there's the information about this dialogue that, let's say I was talking about something else that sounds a lot more scientific about Bubka, which is he avoided having energy being lost in the plant box, which is the reason he could jump so high, which is something that his coach says, but something which is not physically possible because the plant box doesn't move, it doesn't take on any energy. But this is part of the dialogue in coaching about the event and how it's done. And I find this to be a little bit of a problem. That's a big reason for this lecture. Okay, let me give you another example. Pole vault poles that bend store energy and they're not 100% efficient. So what happens is when it flexes and then it straightens out, it actually, uh, some of the energy put into it turns into heat that's not re returned to the vaulter. So it loses a little bit of energy. 
Uh, it's a very small amount. It's usually on the range of like one to three percent of the energy that's put into it. All right. Straight poles, and we still do straight pole vaulting. So this is a pole that doesn't bend. They don't take on any energy. They don't lose any energy. So I'm going to say that it should be high, um, possible for athletes to jump higher with straight poles because they don't lose energy than flexible poles, which do lose energy. Now, anyone who's familiar with the pole vault knows that what I said is completely absurd. At the, ad, at the advent and the use of flexible poles, uh, the world record immediately jumped up several feet, and it's now about 25% higher than it was when we used straight poles. And do we think that athletes now are generating 25% more speed or power than they were in the use of straight poles? I, I don't think that's the answer either. Everything I said about this difference between losing energy and flexible poles losing energy and that we should be able to jump higher with straight poles, all the things I said there are factually correct and logically consistent. And yet, when I go to make this final claim that we should be able to jump with straight, higher with straight poles than flexible poles, it doesn't make sense. Answer this question a little bit later about why that is. And it's the, the basic thing is that there's information that's been left out that is relevant to the difference between straight poles and flexible poles. This sort of phenomenon happens with discussions of the pole vault as well all the time. There's a set of facts which are put together logically and then there's a conclusion made, except the conclusion is wrong because of the things that have been left out of the analysis. All right, so now I'm going to start trying to put this all together. <clears throat> there's basically two ways scientifically to jump higher. One is you can generate more energy. And the second way is that you can direct that energy more efficiently. And when we talk about sort of about whether the technique is capable of generating more energy or not. Or, and if it's not capable of generating more energy, then it has to have to do something with the direction that the energy is being directed. Now. I could fill up this board with a lot of math and physics equations, but that's not going to do you any good. And it's also, when I have vaulters, it's not going to do them a whole lot of good either. But I believe it's important for coaches and people who want to understand the event to maybe understand the physics. So I'm going to avoid a lot of math and physics equations. And I'm going to use demonstrations like with this device that I've made here and a hand weight and a piece of pole and so forth. And these are things that I use with my vaulters uh, day, on a daily, day in, day out basis to help inform them tactically of the physics involved with the pole vault. And hopefully that informs them about why they need to do certain techniques and what are the important parts of that te technique that they need to stress. Um, part of this, there's, there's plenty of drills, uh, drill videos, books, all these things out there to inform you about how to go about uh, teaching or training a pole vaulter. And yet, I feel like there's, uh, if you understand this underlying physics, it will help you sort through the drills, pick out which drills your vault, particular vaulter needs to do and work on, uh, and what are the stress points, important points of that drill to emphasize while you're doing it. <clears throat> so, everyone here I hope has been uh, in an automobile and encountered a hill, right? 
So you encounter a hill, when you're going up the hill, what happens to your car? It's gonna slow down unless you press on the gas. Well, this is very informative of the pole vault because we are trying to go up in the air. And the pole vault functions very much like your car going up a hill. And as your, you know, the athlete starts to go to slow down. And managing this relationship of horizontal to vertical energy is really what the pole vault is, is about. <clears throat> so there's two kinds of energy, and these are the two, I'm going to write two equations. So we have kinetic energy. And we have potential energy. OK, the equation for kinetic energy is 1 half the mass times the velocity squared. And for potential energy, it's mass times gravity times height. And like I said, we know about potential energy, and explain it this way is, if you drive your car up a hill and you don't put on the gas, eventually it's going to stop. And if you don't put on the brake, it has the potential to roll back down the hill, and you do not want to be behind it, OK? <laughs> Kinetic energy is the energy of moving things. So this could be uh, the athlete running down the runway, or this could be an arrow shot from a bow, or anything that's moving. And it's notable that we have V squared here. For the pole vault, this means that any increase that your athlete can gain in running speed or takeoff speed is going to be multiplied by itself in creating energy. So there's an energy curve. This is why it is supremely important that your athlete runs as fast as possible with the pole and when they take off, they're moving as fast as possible because speed equals height. This is, here we have gravity. <clears throat> and we have H. And basically, the relationship between these two is this is the hill, height. And as this goes up, this V squared has to go down. So when we see a vaulter, one of the things that happens in what I call the folk physics of the vault is a coach will see an athlete start to go up, and they'll say, you're losing energy. And they're really not losing energy. Their energy is being converted into potential energy. What they're losing is velocity, OK? Now. I'm going to draw several hills here. Another physical system. And this is, so I'm going to have a car here and a car here. OK. I'm going through this fast. This is a pendulum. So this is basically a big cable with a hook on it here for my car. All three of these cars are going the same speed. That speed equals energy. They're all going to stop at the same height. But here's what we can notice. When we look at the pole ball, everyone's really, really fascinated about, oh, they're going up at the end. But when you start coaching the event, you realize that he's crossing a horizontal distance here, too. So this is important about how steep this hill is. OK? My, this is my energy level, because all these cars are traveling the same speed. They're all going to stop at the top of the hill. This is my pendulum. My car is going to stop right here. This is the basic. I can only jump as high as the energy I have generated in the vault. 
I can never jump higher than the energy I generate. It's just impossible. It's physically impossible. There's no magic wand in this event. And it's sometimes I get, get accused of saying there's a magic wand with the, with the pole vault. There's some magic way to jump higher than the energy you can create. But in fact, it's, I'm trying to point out quite the opposite. But if you notice, even though these cars are going to travel the same vertical distance, they travel different horizontal distances. OK? If this is a case where I have a crossbar here, and I have a crossbar that's roughly the same you know, horizontal, this car will go over the crossbar, and this car will not because it's not traveled enough horizontal distance. And this is a part of the considerations for the pole vault. It's about this energy curve. One of the things to say about potential energy <clears throat> is we do not normally look at objects and consider that they have potential energy. If I take this eraser and I push it to the edge of the table, though, it falls. If I put it on the table, I don't normally look at it and say, well, it's full of potential energy. This is part of the reason why we get into this problem of energy management and coaches saying, well, you're losing energy. It's because this potential energy with gravity is invisible. It's completely a rational concept not a visible concept. When something's moving with kinetic energy, I can see it moving, I know it's got energy. And when it slows down, I have some sense about something's happened with the energy level. But it's, it's I can't exactly say that it's lost energy. Um, I know it gets a little complicated, but <clears throat> it may have just gone up the hill. The energy will be reclaimed if it starts rolling. <clears throat> now, energy is very interesting to us because, um, like, if we have an oven, we want to put energy into it and hold it there. And if we have a refrigerator, we want to pump the energy, the heat out and have it stay out. And energy likes to follow the path of least resistance. <clears throat> which means your oven eventually cools off, and if you don't keep your refrigerator plugged in, it's going to warm up. And the same thing is true, you know, water running down a hill is because of its potential energy, and it's going to follow the path of least resistance. Part of the problem with the pole vault is the path of least resistance is not the path that's going to allow your jumper to jump the highest. And so there's this balancing act between directing the energy where it uh, wants to go versus where you need it to go to jump high. Part of the best way that I can go about uh, talking about this is to talk about uh, a bow and arrow. And I think everybody hopefully is familiar with a bow and arrow and about energy trajectories. OK. So if I have a bow, it's very similar to the pole vault in that you know you pull the bow and it bends, it's a spring. You know that bow is a spring. And when our pole vault pole bends, it's a spring as well. So if I'm here with the bow and arrow, I can shoot the arrow this way, or I could turn and I can shoot it, say, this way, or if I turn my bow this way, I can shoot it vertically. OK? If I have the same bow and I pull it the same distance, I'm going to get the same energy out of it. So this energy trajectory and this energy tra trajectory and this energy tra trajectory all have an arrow on them that has the same amount of energy, even though the shape 
of those trajectories are different. Okay? So what this informs us is we may see pole vault trajectories that are very, very different that have the same amount of energy. So if my vaulter is jumping and their jump's very flat and horizontal, there where they can maybe jump higher vertically, but they've got to turn that energy up. Everything which moves in, like is thrown or shot into the atmosphere and the Earth's gravity follows a path that's called a parabola. And the parabola is uh, well studied in science and it has certain mathematical properties. And I think we can see if we want to go vertically in our pole vault, then the parabola that we need to have is a very high skinny parabola. And this would be like if I have a bow, I got to be standing here and I have to shoot my bow vertically in this parabolic trajectory to maximize its height. This is the pole vault and this is the crossbar. So this part of this does not change. If I'm standing back here with my bow and I try to shoot my arrow over this crossbar and it's got the same amount of energy, what happens here is I'm going to get this kind of parabola because I haven't made all of my energy go vertically and I cannot do that with th from this position here. I have to be here, okay? Or I have to have more energy. I can have this parabola, okay? But I have to have be back here with a much stronger bow and I have to shoot my, inner, my arrow with more speed and more energy to be able to do this. So one of the things too is when we look at the pole vault, I look at this, the backside of the event. So if I see my way to the back of the pit, I know that they have energy that they could actually turn into the vertical and jump higher. They need a better trajectory, though. Walter has to take off and drive horizontally because they need to get themselves in a, in a pattern to turn vertically and get on this high, narrow parabola. Okay, if I make this simply about the vault, and I showed we can have different sort of arrow patterns, okay? So here, here's the outside of my parabola. Okay, this is once again my crossbar. My successful vault is going to have a shape something like this. Athlete takes off, they swing up, they rock back, they get in the vertical, they're going to clear this, okay? Let's say my athlete takes off the ground here and they turn up too fast and they consistently go up too fast and this is my maximum energy level here what's going to happen? They're going to stop right here. They have not crossed the crossbar. This is not a successful vault, and basically what happens is they're going to come straight back down. This is one of the ways that a vault fails. It's a very common way, in that they don't manage their energy and are able to drive it forward and get in a position to get on the proper parabola, okay? There's another way that this vault might be unsuccessful, and that's that they actually stay down here, stay down here, and then they land like this. 
so they've never managed to get their energy to go into the vertical the way they need to, and they go under the crossbar, and they land on the back of the pit. Part of this might be due to technique. They just happen to swing up too fast. There are very accomplished vaulters who occasionally will just, they'll swing up too fast. Or it might have something to do with the pole that we pick. This pole's too stiff, this pole's too soft. So in this sort of matrix between pole selection and, and technique, it, it can get kind of complicated to make the right choices so that the athlete maximizes their potential and energy. All of these have the same energy level though. This does not have less energy because it turns up too fast. It's just that the energy hasn't been managed in the proper curve. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that potential energy curve with the vault. So I got, a, I got my crossbar here and we can move the crossbar a little bit, but let's, Let's say we keep it steady, okay? Here's my landing. Here's my takeoff. Five feet, six feet, seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, 10 feet, 11 feet, 12 feet, 13 feet. If it's not obvious by now, this curve's gonna look a little bit different based on all these takeoffs. Now, part of this is that this, we might raise or lower our crossbar, but just to give you a sense, so here's, here's five feet, okay? I'm gonna draw another line here, just for a second. This is uh, basically my athlete's center of mass moving on this line. So here's six feet, here's seven feet, here's eight feet, here's nine feet, here's 10 feet, here's 11 feet, 12, 13. Actually, that's not drawn very well. <laughs> let, me, let me go over this. I hope you're getting a sense of what I'm trying to show here, though, is that depending on the athlete, the pole they're on, and like the speed they run, and so forth, different. So I have five feet, six feet, seven feet, eight feet, All right, at some point, they all have to converge on this parabola to maximize their height. But since they're taken off at a different place, the things that they need to do are different. So when we have beginning vaulters taken off at five feet, there's not a lot of space here for them to get themselves inverted, and they basically have to just whip their body up as fast as they can into the vertical. As it goes along and they move out, now this curve has a different shape and they're gonna have to use different technique to make this vault happen. And basically what it means is they have to wait here at the bottom and drive their pole across this extra distance. And it's an adjustment. Every time we change a pole or change the athlete's grip height we're asking them to almost inevitably move backwards, it means almost relearning their vault. They're gonna have to do something different to make the pole move forward. So when we challenge athletes with bigger poles, this is something that we know. 
they're going to have to change their swing rate. They're going to have to change their technique a little bit. It's going to be a little bit different. All right. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of pendulums. And we have two different kinds of pendulums with the pole vault. So the pole actually acts as a, um, we call it inverted pendulum. So it turns this way and goes basically we're working in this uh, upper horizontal area. And the vaulter is here and swings this way on the top hand. So we have these two pendulums together. And uh, double pendulum systems are very, very, very interesting. And uh, if you're at home or once you get home, you might want to go on the internet and look at double pendulum systems. They have very, very unique properties of motion uh, when they're put you put two pendulums together, it's called chaotic motion. <clears throat> and it's very interesting to look at. People put these things together, put them online with lights and colors, and it's, it's really fun to look at those. <clears throat> but it has implications for uh, the vault. <clears throat> now, one of the things, uh, so first talk about the, the pole and the vaulter. So, one of the things that I show um, very often is the relationship between the pull breaking force and its angle. And basically it is uh, the higher the angle of this pull, the less horizontal resistance it's going to have to movement. So if I put this up really high in front of me like this and I walk forward, it moves very easily. And I do this with my athletes. I'm like, okay, put this up and I want you to walk forward. Does it move? Yeah, I can walk forward and that's, that's I can move the pole pretty easy. If I drop this down so much as just like put it by my ear and I try to walk forward, it's almost impossible. And what happens is if I, run down real fast and plant my pole like this, the pole doesn't move and I get whipped out here and bad things happen. I'm gonna probably land on my back or get hurt. This, the pole moves easily and we want to move horizontally. That's the first thing that we have to learn how to do. So I, I show my athletes that all the time Okay, but as I said, we have a relationship between this pole motion. Now, my pole, and I have this angle, and I want to increase this angle, okay? I want to maximize this. So here's my vaulter. In order to maximize this angle with the pole here, this angle, I need my vaulter to be as tall as possible and straight. I stress this over and over. You want to stretch into the takeoff because it's going to maximize this angle. If your athlete is not stretched, you know, so, I have a crooked arm here, and I'm leaning back here, and my leg is kind of squashed and bent, right? I'm gonna have this angle. I'm terrible at these drawings, but I think you can see the point here. So these are all like situations I look for with my, you know, athlete. You want to see this, tall, maximized. Anytime there's a plant drill, I'm telling my athlete, stretch that plant. If I'm doing plant drills and my athlete's planting like this, and they're not tall and straight, 
guess what? They're going to get more pole breaking force. And the result is that for this athlete, they're going to get immediately swung up, right? And what did I just show you recently? That you can get swung up too fast. This is going to, the pole's not going to move here. This athlete here, their center of mass is going to move forward. The pole, this top hand's going to move forward. And then they're going to move forward and swing up. This one, this pole's not going to move. Their hips are going to get slung forward and up. And they're going to stall out, is basically. This is, you know, one of the ways that an, a, uh, a vault fails. This is also why it's really bad, and it's very common, for the athlete to uh, lean back. So if my athlete is just so happens to be leaning back like this, all right, in their pole, This is, a, this is the circle of their maximum reach height, so it would be here, right? So if I lean back into my takeoff, I'm dropping my pole, I'm going to get more pole breaking force, okay? And now I am already sort of progressed in my swing, I'm going to go straight, like straight up here like this. Instead of what should happen is this should swing forward and then up. But it's not going to happen out of this position. Because I'm leaning back, I'm going to have more pull breaking force. This top hand, instead of me moving it forward and up, when I lean back, it rotates back. So when I do this, when I take off, I'm not moving my pole. And I need to move my pole forward so that I can go up on the proper parabola to go over the crossbar. I know that's a, it's maybe a little confusing, but it's just, this is why any sort of motion at the, at the plant where you're seeing the torso, the head, this arm, anything like go back you're with your athlete, and this is very common, is it's going to hamper the vault. It's going to make it harder for them to control this energy in the proper curve so that they can maximize their vault. <clears throat> so... This is a demonstrator also of, that I built to show some stuff about um, forces and the pole vault and how they work. So the first one I'm going to show you is I'm going to put energy into the pole. And this blue is my vaulter. And if you notice, if I put energy into the pole, not, I'm blocking it a little bit. It's getting caught. Hold on. All right. So I move this. As long as it's not getting caught and it freely swings, we notice that this part, when I put energy into the pole, stays vertical. This is because of gravity and this geometry that I'm talking about, where our vaulter wants to stay vertical and straight. It maximizes the pole movement. So if the energy comes in from the vaulter, we want them to maintain this position because it's going to move the pole the most. All right? We do this as a drill, and we call it an overtip. So they go over the tip of the poles, basically. And they're learning to ride the pole and move the pole in this position. OK? But what's the other thing I talked about with energy? It likes to follow the path of least resistance. 
and their energy is coming down the runway this way and they take off. I'm simulating their energy being put into the system and the pull horizontally by pulling on this. And what do we notice? The first thing that wants to happen is the vaulter wants to swing pendulary on the top hand and then at some point later there's enough force on the top of the pole at the top hand to move the rig. Or if I hold my rig here and I pull this, there's a certain point here, I'm way out this and now my pole's moving. What am I informing us of here? Well, this is why sort of this plant and takeoff with the pole vault is very, very important. It's why we work on it all the time. It's why pole vault coaches obsess over it. It's because we want the pole to move at takeoff. And the athlete is gonna do something to try and make this top hand and the pole move immediately. That has to do with technique and body position. So as I said, when we have very young vaulters, we work a lot with having them move the pole horizontally. Invariably, then when we put up a crossbar, so they've learned to do this, they're staying on the pole and riding it this way. We put up a crossbar and they go like this and the pole doesn't move. And now, <laughs> and there's, you know, a minor situation that happens. So there's a balance between moving the pole forward with the athlete and then having them swing up to maximize their vertical capability. So there's a whole swing timing issue. But what maximally moves the pole is for the athlete to stay vertical. Now, if I have a straight pole, this is complicated because watch this angle between these two pieces. It closes. It's not a static angle. That means that the, the vaulter with their front hand has to allow a certain amount of movement to maintain the best possible position for moving horizontal with energy. If my athlete on a straight pole, if they lock their hand out and they move forward, what happens is they get pushed back here and this is actually pushing their center of mass up, which takes energy which is going to slow the pole down. Because going from here to here, and if I do it by blocking, this takes energy. It takes energy to move this car up this hill. Old school uh, pole vault coaches call this pole loading. I, know, I don't think that's a very good, technically, a good term about what's going on here but I can sort of explain this with this model and hopefully it helps you uh, when you're watching the vault understand what's happening and uh, <clears throat> how this works. Now if this pole bends, as we can see here, this geometry gets a little different and if we're looking at Mondo Duplantis, he keeps pushing this left arm out, out, out. It gets longer and straighter. And what's he doing? Well, he's pushing, when he takes off, everything he wants to go this way. He wants a swing. That's why he's putting this pressure on with this left hand here. Because if he doesn't do this with his style of jump, he's gonna immediately get thrown forward. That's why no one, you know, I talked about all these coaches, no one would coach the event like he does it because most vaulters are just gonna get thrown way out of position. It's only because he's done this so many times that he can like pull this vault off. So the, the position that moves the pole is to try to stay vertical. And he's doing all this stuff to try to stay vertical. He, when he makes himself longer, He's pushing his center of mass down and back. He drops this front leg. He reaches this left leg back. He's lengthening this arm. He's pushing his shoulder back. He's pushing his hips back and down. 
So he takes off and he kind of swings this way, and as this goes along, he's pushing himself back, or he's trying to. And then at some point, he has to change and then swing forward and go up like this. So it's a very uh, interesting trick. It's a very complicated trick, okay? And there's just sort of more than one way to do it. When I talk about energy, if I, if I push my hand out here on my pole, I'm not really creating more energy. <laughs> and in a sense, pushing this hand out can't really help me jump higher. There are people that don't use this left hand. They don't put any, hardly any pressure on it at all. You can see it. They're not gaining or looning. It's possible to do it that other way. But <clears throat> he does it this way, and there's, I'm trying to give the physics properties of why he's doing it. Uh, one of the things is, if you notice, this thing starts taking off moving. There's an equilibrium of forces at about a 45 degree angle or whatever the pole is. <clears throat> Now there's a thing called the pole cord. That's basically, uh, if we draw from his top hand to the pole tip, <coughs> that's, that's what's called the pole cord. It's the reduction in the sort of grip height distance because the pole's bent. Now, this is important for calculations. If we're doing a physics problem, but for the pole vault, it's not really all that important for anything else. And yet, vault coaches see this all the time. So if I, if I draw his pole cord here, the tip's down here, and it goes like that. And we can sort of see, hey, he's something, he's sort of lined up. That's pattern recognition. Right? So if I do this, well, the my cart starts moving about the time that my falter gets in line with my straight pole. So the straight pole pull cord is the pole itself. It's not because the pole, the cord is magical or anything. It's because I'm pulling this way and gravity's pulling this way and there's an equilibrium where then that force gets transferred to the top hand and the pole and wants to move the pole cord or the pole itself. All right. <clears throat> so when I, when I incorporate gravity into my conceptual physics of the pole vault, it starts answering questions about what, how does the left arm, how does this front arm work? Okay, what, what is it doing with the system that is maybe detrimental or um, helping my athlete through. And the answer is not easy. One of the reasons is because, as I showed you, for a straight pole, this angle is always changing. So I cannot just lock my arm out. Okay, now we have different pole bends. So if we see Mondo here, he's got a whole lot of whole pole bend. You know, he's over here, a whole lot of pole bend. So we can see his arms are straight. Right? He's got this space in here to do that. Well, what if my pole bend's like this much pole bend? And now here's my athlete, okay? And this is their arm length. I can't really push their arm all the way out, okay? So we gotta have them like bend their arm a little bit here in order for them to try to be in the right position. If I don't have very much pole bend at all, right, and my athlete locks their arm out, then we get this kind of thing, you know. And what I said about this, they're not using their length in the, the vertical. The most important line in a pole vault is the vertical line. It's the line of gravity. It's the line that maximizes this reach height distance to reduce pole breaking. It's just the most important line. <clears throat> so
So I had this brain teaser that I gave you earlier about the difference between straight poles and flex poles. Flex poles lose energy. Straight poles don't. Well, what is, what's going on there? Why, why was that not answerable? The answer I gave, which seemed completely reasonable and scientific, why is it wrong? I think this is import, <coughs> important. So this is our vertical line with our crossbar. Here's the ground. OK, here's the path of motion for a, a straight pole. It's a quarter circle. All right, here's my pole. When the athlete takes off here, their hand cannot deviate from this path because the pole does not bend. And what do we notice about what they, happens when they end the vault? Their top hand is moving horizontally. Is horizontally the direction that we want to go? No. Here's how a flex pole vault works. An athlete takes off. This hand, top hand, the pole bends, and this top hand goes forward, and then it curves up. So, flex pull changes the direction of motion and energy from the vertical, or the horizontal, to the vertical. So one of the things with uh, straight pole vaulters like long ago is they had to jump here in order to push this top hand up on this curve. Because this braking force, as I showed you, is it, as you lower the pole, it gets more and more difficult to get the pole to move. So they actually had to jump like up onto the pole to this area where you can see the motion is much more horizontal. Flex pole vaulters don't have to do this, although some of them do. If we pick the right pole, it turns into this vertical. So now, when this top hand comes out and it's being pulled vertically, the other thing the athlete do is they have more time to pull along against gravity in the vertical and drive themselves vertically so that the pull returns vertical energy and then they're given more time to add vertical energy at the end of this vault is why it's possible for athletes to jump so much higher on flexible poles than straight poles. Now, <clears throat> I've never ever seen a coach talk about this, but this uh, also informs us about coaching. A lot of coaches like to do a lot of straight pull work. We start out kids on straight poles. And yet, it's going to be impossible for them to learn how to get off the pole correctly if they're doing straight pole work because the action of the pole at the end of this fault is about 90 degrees different than it's going to be when it's a flex pole. Very much of the vault is learning how to line up this end, end part. I've had plenty of kids that could get on a pole, do a really nice plant, drive the pole forward, couldn't line up the end. <laughs> it's quite a trick. Okay, one of the things to notice about this then is um, about paths and forces. Now, the only thing that stops my vault the only real braking force is gravity, OK? The pole doesn't really, um, it applies braking force, but that force is not, um, it doesn't really add or subtract energy. Now, I told you with flexible poles, it does. And this trade-off of it losing a little bit of energy is much is well worth it in being able to turn all the energy vertically at the end. So <clears throat> let me talk about 
um, the, the pole changes the force direction. So here's my force sort of path for a straight pole. The vaulter comes down, and now they got to follow this curve of the pole and sort of go up and then over. But I want to go vertically. So once they sort of get here to the end, now they have to sort of try to hurry up and change the force direction vertically again. So this is sort of my, my motion path for a straight pole. And one thing we notice is we have to change direction here and change direction here. Here's my path for a flex pole. The vaulter drives forward, it curves up, they go over the crossbar. This looks a whole lot better. <laughs> this requires a whole lot of uh, force to change. We have what's called inertia, right? Inertia, want, anything that's moving wants to stay moving in a straight line. My vaulter's moving in a straight line. There's going to be a whole bunch of force right here, either by the pole pushing. So we have a pole, and the pole is sort of pushing this, this way to change the direction of this motion. When we have a pendulum, when we have a regular pendulum, and this object's going to follow this curve, and the string's going to be given this force, OK? It could be a rod or a string. But it's not really adding or detracting from the total amount of energy. It's just pushing it into this shape. And that's the same thing with the straight pole. It has to push this vault into this sort of shape. Where the flex pole, because it'll, the pole will flex and store this energy and then return it, we get a much better curve. This is much easier to manage than this is. <clears throat> One of the things that vault coaches will talk about and I haven't said anything about it yet, is what's called rotational inertia. So this is the energy of rotating objects in relation to inertia. Uh, the most common uh, picture I give you is figure skating. If you've seen figure skating, you know when they put their arms and legs out, they slow down. When they move their arms and legs together, they speed up their spin. Well, this does apply to this inverted pendulum of the pole vault. So if, I, if this system is spinning in some way and my center of mass goes from here to here, it's going to slow this down. And co pole vault coaches are very sort of obsessed with this relationship about, OK, I want to shorten my pole cord and I want to make sure my rotational uh, inertia is maximized towards uh, you know, pole speed. So this is, this is faster and this is slower. Here's the only thing. They're forgetting gravity. And while it is true that if the vaulter does something to move themselves up the pole, they're going to slow down, inertia cannot stop the pole from ever rotating. What does that is gravity. So, and you'll see this all the time, uh, talking about rotational inertia in this pole vault problem. And it is vastly dominated by gravity. And that if the vaulter makes themselves go up, they have to use energy against gravity. And at some point, they're going to run out of energy, and the whole thing's going to stop. Um, I'd hope to have a little demonstration of this. But one of the things you have to imagine is, you know, my figure skater spinning perpendicular to gravity. So they're, when they're spinning this way, gravity's not affecting them. If, if we turn the thing sideways and we have a weight, if you can imagine like a bicycle wheel weight on it, and I spin it, it's going to speed up over here and it's going to slow down over here. And if I got away from Earth's gravity, if I was in space and I could 
you know, do this. If I move the weight in or out, it would speed up or slow down the wheel spinning, just like the figure skater. It can't make it stop. So this rotational inertia can never keep the vaulter from reaching the plane of the crossbar. But vault coaches will talk about this all the time as if it's, you know, really super important. It's, it's not that what they're saying isn't true, but that, that consideration is vastly dominated by the considerations of gravity and that when the vaulter goes up, uh, their energy is being converted into potential energy. And that's the thing which usually stops the vault and makes it stall out. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the late vault. And once again, I told you that, so we have this vertical line um, and gravity. And we know our, our vaulter is rotating in a pendulum motion. And guess what? The further away they get from the vertical, the worse it gets. For them. It's really bad to be out for them that when they swing to swing out here because gravity's pulling down all right and it also has to do with the pole <clears throat> so when i have a pendulum and it swings this way eventually because gravity's pulling down it's going to slow down and stop and then it's going to reverse direction and gravity's going to pull it and it's going to swing back this way. Okay? So let's imagine that I have my pendulum is right here. Okay? Here's gravity's force. This force is completely decelerating our weight and it's not pulling on this at all. Well, this basically represents a top hand. If I'm vertical and I'm hanging on this here and gravity's pulling through my center of mass, I get a force downward here on the top of the pole. And as I swing out, this force gets to be less. So it, it, it gets smaller with the greater that this angle gets. And guess what happens to my pole when I want to swing out here? It wants to start to decompress. It wants to start to straighten out. So uh, if you look, and once again, here's Mondo. He keeps working back. He's going to roll up and sort of tuck sort of under his top hand. OK? Bubka was very, very well known because he had a very, very high rate of swing speed. So he would take off and he would kick. Basically, he would drive his pole forward and then he would kick. And he would, this, when he got away from this vertical line, he went very fast. All the way into the vertical. One of the things that we see with kids that are, are not accomplished fathers is they get stuck out here. Okay, this is the same, you know, thing I was talking about. The equilibrium for this happens, you know, right here. And if the vaulter doesn't do something to keep this moving, they, they get stuck here. We have this problem with these kids all the time. Sometimes it has to do with having enough strength to drive their hands over and then work their hips up. Uh, part of it is technique, about getting onto the pole and setting up your kick swing and getting through here. But the basic idea is the further out that your vaulter is out here, the, the worse things are. So you need to get them to speed through the vertical. And I'm gonna start talking about Buka here again because he was so good at this. Uh, his coach was uh, named Petrov. Petrov's probably the
great uh, pole vault coach in history, really kind of bad at academic physics. And this is why I mentioned, he said a lot of stuff about this event that doesn't really make any sense from a, a standard textbook physics perspective. That doesn't mean that Buka's technique was bad. It really just means that uh, Petrov was bad at using physics to explain what he was doing. Um, he, did, he, didn't, he never talked about gravity, so a lot of the things that are very important to the event, he just failed to talk about. Um, like, again, that doesn't mean there's, that Buk is a bad vaulter or that I have any sort of uh, criticism of his vault that I could be, oh, I could make it they're better. I could make your vault better. I don't think that exists, but I think we could understand his vault a little bit better if we understand the physics and Buka was very good at getting off the pole, and I'm gonna go through that right now, okay? So, <clears throat> got this point here, and let me just look at my notes here, because it's sort of interesting to draw. So this is basically three parts of his pole progression. And so we have All right, so this here, this is the center of mass. For any human being, their center of mass is generally around their like waist, okay? How he manages his center of mass in relation to getting off the pole is impeccable. This, this part he was very, very good at, okay? So, as I told you, as I move out this way, this gets worse. Well, here's his, you know, hips out here, his center of mass. Here's, here's where my pole's giving me vertical thrust, and then I have this distance. This is a rotational distance. Basically what I'm talking about here is gravity's pulling down on his center of mass and the pole is trying to straighten up and is returning vertical thrust and it's gonna make him wanna spin this way. The thing he does is he uses his muscles and he sets up, a, he had the most powerful swing ever, fastest swing. He speeds through this part of the vault really, really fast. And if we go to this one, he's shortened this rotational distance. And if we go to this one, the, he's completely closed it. So what he does is he speeds through this area of the vault as fast as he can, and he snaps his hips up to his top hand, and he does this his pole is not yet decompressed. I, got, I have pictures of this. I don't think I printed that one out, but <clears throat> this is very key to maximizing the athlete's vault. Now, Mondo and some other guys do a little different in that they roll sort of back up under this top hand in the tuck, but they're still trying to line up vertically with the top hand. This is what I call an open swing. There's some advantages with doing it this way. One is the pole doesn't really get in the way. When a vaulter does what's known as a tuck vault, so they're gonna be in this sort of tucked up position, the pole's actually sort of in the way. 
and it takes a, a little bit of a trick to learn how to do a tuck and then get out of it vertically. A lot of, a lot of vaulters, when they tuck, then they, they happen to want to drive horizontally <laughs> off the pole. He snaps his hips up. He catches all of this vertical thrust from the pole. I have a little bit of demonstration about how this works. I'm going to take the stubby. This is the vaulter swinging under the pole, and my top hand is going to mimic the pole for the athlete. Athlete swings up, and if I want to go vertical and I push, right, this has to be balanced. So this is quite a trick with the pole vault to get balanced and catch vertical pole thrust because most kids want to swing here. They want to press their feet out at the crossbar. Bubka presses his feet back out the top of the pole, okay? And then when my pole pushes up here, guess, watch what happens. Did we go up? No, we spun off the top. And this spinning takes energy. Um, and it's energy that's not being driven vertically. So our athlete has to get in the vertical before the pole fully decompresses and straightens out and catch this energy and drive with it to go vertically. If they don't, and most kids, about this point, they're like, oh, I need to go over the crossbar. No, they need to lay back, rock back, drive vertically so that they can be pushed up. And their natural motion will then push them over the crossbar. Does that make sense? That's, that's, the, that's the hard part. I've had plenty of kids that I can plant, drive the pole, catching that vertical thrust most efficiently it is very difficult. It's hard to learn, and a lot of their natural reaction is <laughs> to push the center of mass out this way, and the pole comes up, and their hips drop. Um, <clears throat> this has some repercussions about um, pole choice and uh, safety with the event, all right? So <clears throat> here I have the end of a vault. This is my pole. This is my crossbar. You know, this is my athlete, right? Here's their feet. They're looking inside. Pole's going up here. Hips are going down here. And so it drives their legs onto the crossbar. So this is bad. Crossbar is going to fall. OK? If I can actually get them to lay back here and get their hips up here and their feet up here, right? Now I've got all this space in here. They're not going to hit the crossbar. Well, when I see this, so my athlete's not being efficient at getting into the vertical, and they're hitting the crossbar, what am I going to do? Well, one of my choices is to get a bigger pole, because I feel like i got to move them you know, back so that I've got more space in here. And this is where a lot of uh, maybe inexperienced vault coaches and even experienced ones just get in a situation where now I got to put my kid on a pole that's too big, and you wind up with an accident. So um, it's just if you get the athlete to get into the vertical, they can actually clear higher heights with a smaller pole, and it's going to be safer. Uh, now, now, this is all easy for me to stand up here and say because I've been in this position. But you know, a part of it is, you know, I've had the athlete come to me and say, "Hey, I need to get on the bigger pole. I'm I'm hitting the crossbar going up," and I have to say, "Well, the problem's not the pole. The problem is your technique, and you're not really getting your feet in the vertical and driving vertical with the pole. You're flagging off, and you're causing this rotation that's causing your 
you know, feet and legs to be rotated down on the pole as opposed to catching the vertical energy and driving up. Uh, the demonstration I do about that has to do with all this, and it's setting up the the kick swing. Okay, so I have this hand weight. I show my kids this all the time. If I if I set this up, if I reach back and I kick kick this, then and this is supposed to be my foot. If I kick this foot, I can get this over my head. So this represents me kicking into the vertical kick into the vertical, reach back, kick, vertical. A lot of young vaulters will come down, they'll take off, they'll kick their feet out up, they'll pull up with their legs, and then they'll kick their feet out straight in front of them, and then it's almost impossible to do. And I give them this hand weight. I'm like, okay, swing this over your head. Hey, yeah, coach, that's pretty easy. Okay, um, pick it up, punch it out, and get it to move. It's not easy. So we do a lot of, that's why good coaches are going to do a lot of like high bar work, rope work, uh, trying to get their athlete informed about the swing. I use this hand weight as a very tactile demonstration about this is a good efficient swing. It's easy to do. If you pull your feet up, kick your feet out in front of you, you're going to get stuck there. You're going to get stuck out here where it's bad. It gets, it's really gravity makes this thing, when I push it out, gravity makes this really heavy, hard to move. You know, if I speed it through with a good setup, it's not that bad. Uh, for my plant, like I said, I'm always like stretch. When you get onto the poles, you want to actually physically feel yourself pushing your hands up and your your torso, lower torso down, and feel this stretching. So I call it opening the front side. Uh, a lot of athletes will want to close the front side. So it's very natural when something pushes on us. We want to so they'll want to push their hands forward here. Once again, I want to be vertical. This is my highest reach height. Anything really far this way is bad or really far this way is bad. So that's why I'm like, push up. There's a natural stretch reflex. Stretch this way into this kick and not close the front side like this. Because when they close the front side, they're gonna turn this vault up too fast. And it's gonna stall out. <clears throat> um, So, Buka's coach, Petrov, said that you had to do this free takeoff, and it's not this. <laughs> it's not the one that, that uh, Duplantis does, okay? It's basically that the athlete wants to be leaving the ground before the pole starts to bend. And in this sense, it's, they're doing this stretching activity, okay? They're maximizing this. Now, they actually believe they need to displace themselves and jump vertically. Uh, the problem with that is um, it's changing this vault trajectory and that it takes energy. Now, <clears throat> it's not losing energy. So there's this whole thing about how this works the, uh, the free takeoff is, is not, it's not bad to do it. It's just not, uh, it doesn't change the energy state. So the, there's a few places that the pole vault actually loses energy. Or in engineering, we have to account for all of it so I can account for it. There's wind resistance, we're running and swinging through the air. Uh, the pole tip goes in the box and it has to turn there's pole tip friction there. Um, <clears throat> the pole, once again, it, it loses a little bit of energy as heat. There's a little bit of dissipation. There's no major way for the vault to lose a lot of energy. There's just nowhere for it to go. 
Petrov says, well, it goes out of the box. Well, pole vault box doesn't move. If it moved, we wouldn't be able to vault. So th this was his rationale about why you had to do the free take off to jump higher. It solves a lot of problems, actually. Like I said, we want our kids to stretch, and the free takeoff is a like stretch takeoff. Um, but it's not, it's obviously, as uh, Mondo Duplantis <laughs> demonstrates, it's not necessary to do that. He, he's not losing energy, and he's able to maintain and work through the forces on this pole and pull off one of the highest jumps of all time. <clears throat> if we talk about gravity, it also addresses another problem concept in the pole vault, which is called rowing. So basically, it's that when the athlete takes off, they're going to start pushing this top hand this way. And invariably, what you see is a break in the shoulders, OK? And they're moving their center of mass on this circle up. So if the athlete does this rowing, and they move their center of mass forward and up, it's going to slow the pole down. It's a pretty easy explanation once you understand if you have gravity in here. Uh, there's a video that I watched on the internet. It's about half an hour long, where the guy is trying to give a technical description of why rowing is bad in the vault. And like I say, once you understand the relationship between kinetic energy, potential energy, and gravity, uh, why rowing is bad becomes very clear very quickly. You know, if I'm in the proper position back here, my center of mass is going to be lower and back. I get a better force on the top of the pole, on my pole hand, and I have more horizontal. I'm going to conserve my horizontal velocity. And I'm going to conserve my pole speed. My system's going to be moving faster horizontally. So. Like I said, a lot of it is about trying to stay in the vertical. Um, I'm almost done here. Uh, I can do like a system of vaulters, see? So if this is my center of mass line, Sort of, this is my top hand line. I want to be uh, straight in the vertical here. OK. If I roll my hand, my athlete rolls their hand forward, right? It's going to ultimately raise their center of mass and slow the system. OK. Um, this is this is rowing. So then this goes here. So they've raised their center of mass. Pole's going to slow down. The other the other way is. Um, If the hand rolls back too far, now it's going to some, but if it's like way back here, then it's going to lift my center of mass again. So this is partly why I say this vertical line is the most important line in the pole vault. So this is what you're, you're looking for. When you start to see that your athlete is not straight, or maybe doesn't have a nice sort of curve to their body. OK, when they're breaking at the shoulders forward or really far back, it's going to cause the pole not to move as well. Um, most of this stuff has gone through, actually, by many coaches. They understand this 
on a uh, intuitive level that these sorts of uh, looks in the vault are bad. The thing that I'm doing here is explaining why. It's because all of these activities displace the vault or center of mass up, which takes energy, which makes the system slow down. Now, the, the crazy thing is, is they haven't really lost the energy. There's people that get themselves in sort of bad positions with the pole vault that are then able to, you know, pull this out and direct their energy vertically. It's just, it's a harder vault that way. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> let me talk about one last thing. This is kind of uh, esoteric. So when you watch good vaulters, Um, there's what's called a sec what I call a secondary compression on the pole. So he's going into it right here. If you can look from this point to this point, right here, he's getting more pole bend. Why is he getting more pole bend? Well, it's because he's taking his feet from below him and he's raising them. So he's raising his center of mass against the pole. The pole is the only thing that vaults are, once they take off, it's the only thing that they can put any force on. And since he's raising his center of mass, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, and it's that this pole's going to bend more. Now, here's the whole thing. There's uh, coaches that will say that this is necessary to keep this pole moving forward at speed. Except there's one problem with this. The rotational center of mass of this system is not the pole cord length. It's actually from the pole tip to his center of mass. And with him moving his legs up and away, he's actually moving his center of mass up away from the pole tip. And he's going to make this system slow down. We want that to happen. If we look at this curve again, Right, here's my crossbar, here's my, basically my pole vault potential energy curve. Here's my horizontal. I wanna be going fast, fast, and now my horizontal is gonna slow down. If he were actually, we don't wanna speed up here. If we speed up here, we're gonna go, we're gonna go this way, we're gonna go under the crossbar. He's actually pulling his center of mass into the vertical, slowing his horizontal motion, slowing the pole, because we want the pole to come out in the vertical. We don't want it to keep rotating. And so the way that we do that is by pulling this up. It's, it's timing. It's a timing event. We have to sort of relearn this timing over and over again when we change poles, when we change our grip height, um, it, it, that's just a part of the process. And we go through that with our athletes here all the time. Uh, this is supposed to uh, work in part of the recruiting video for our club to let parents out there know this is how we approach the video. That um, uh, I've had an obsession with this for quite some time. <laughs> uh, and, but just hopefully it pays off for the athletes to come and jump, you know, with our club. And hopefully, I hope this video has informed some coaches about these concepts. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to get some uh, questions and some pushback on some of this stuff. But everything that I've talked about is really rooted in uh, science that I've studied and taught <laughs> and know. So uh, everyone that's actually here, I'd like to thank you for coming and witnessing this in person. Uh, and I'd like to thank you know, anyone that's watching this out there on the, the internet. You know, if you have questions, hopefully I'll be able to answer them.